praise God. Oh, thank you very much. Be seated in heavenly places. The Bible says that's where we are, amen? Oh, we are. We truly are. It's awesome. Awesome to be here among you today. I haven't been here since February, I think it was. On I've been online. Every Sunday I'm online. And I know many of you joined in during that time as well. And there's, I don't know how many online right now, but uh, I'm always amazed to see how many folks are, are joining in. Um, for the past six months, well, I, let me back up a minute. In January, I was whining, excuse me, I was praying about how fast time was going. And, um, and then in March, time stopped. So you got to be careful what you pray for. And, um, and I found out during the, the, during the shutdown period and everything that I have learned to develop some world-class napping skills. <laughs> yeah, one day on a Sunday, uh, I had a nap before church. I had a nap after church, and then I had another nap later in the afternoon. <laughs> that was, a, I'm telling you, a hat trick. It was like, boom. <laughs> Resting in the Lord. I've always lived by the maximum that, that, maxim that says that when the going gets tough, the tough go to sleep. And I'm telling you, it's biblical. Jesus was in the back of the boat when the uh, winds came up and the waves were going. And, you know, Bill Johnson says that you don't have any authority over any storm that you can't sleep in. So I guess God's given me a lot of authority because I've been sleeping a lot here. Before the shutdown, I want to uh, draw your attention. If, if, you were, if you're new to City Lights, you can go on online and you can look at all of the past uh, um, sermons and things like that. And, and back in, I think it was in the end of January, beginning of February, Pastor Kurt did a series on the dwelling place. And in the dwelling place, he was talking about that perfect zone where life can exist. And I think we have a slide for that, um, the slide that he showed. And um, what you see there is the earth right there in that green zone, which is the habitable zone. And it's amazing when you study all these facts out that the earth is the perfect size at the perfect distance from the sun in perfect relationship to other planets uh, for life to be sustained here. And you don't have life on any of the other planets that we know of on, uh, as it is here on the earth. So the Goldilocks zone is what that's referred to. And Pastor Kurt had talked about the fact that he wants city lights to live in that Goldilocks zone. And he gave us three points in his message, that first message. And those points were unity, humility, and focus on Jesus. Those are easy to remember, right? Write it down on your Palm Pilot or whatever you need to do to keep it. Unity, humility, focus on Jesus. Unity is not all of us being in agreement and having the same attitude or the same, excuse me, having the same opinion about things, but it's having the same attitude that we are here to know Jesus. We are here to make him known. We are here to be the city lights of Greeley. In fact, God is about ready to light this city up. He's already started, and not just here. He's got other sheepfolds in the city that he's beginning to light up and empower with his Holy Spirit, and he's getting ready to light Greeley up again. My uh, friend Hannah Hartman calls this reality, and, um, and it's about to become God's reality. Uh, yeah, get ready for that. So it's going to be fun. We're going to see what's going on when the Holy Spirit does this. The second point about humility is not about becoming worms. You know, it's not humility to think less of yourself. Humility is thinking, not thinking of yourself at all. <laughs> in thinking of others, and in honor, preferring one another. But don't put yourself down. You know, when, when God comes to me and tells me who I am, and he tells me my identity, humility is coming into agreement with what he says. And, um, and so I want to agree with him. When he said to Gideon, when he said, Gideon, you mighty man of valor, and Gideon's going, who are you talking to? That's not humility. Humility would be a humble heart before God and say, as you say, Lord. 
It is as you say. I don't know how to be a mighty man of God without him. Amen? No one does. And that third thing about focus on Jesus is focusing on his presence with us, which we've really enjoyed this morning, Lord. I have been really, really blessed to be among all the sheep here this morning and and to sense your presence. Thank you so much. And then he starts distributing presence gifts, healings, and things like that to us. He's amazing. So Pastor Kurt told me earlier this year he wanted me to speak toward the end of the summer. And um, I think... I think he knew he had this wedding today somewhere up in the Dakotas. And I just want to pray for him and and, uh, uh, Pastor Emily real quickly. Father, I know that that you put blessings upon those that you want released into your body. And there is a huge blessing on Kurt and Emily in their marriage, beautiful marriage. And Lord, I just ask you to release that blessing to this couple up there in the Dakotas, that they will walk in that same glory that Kurt and Emily walk in, and they'll walk in that same um, marriage that you have put upon them, blessing them with your presence. And that couple will may not, they just may not know what hit them, but Lord, let it be today uh, on earth as it's done in heaven. In Jesus' name. So when I was listening to the dwelling place in that series of messages, I sensed the Holy Spirit was giving me this message that I'm about to deliver today. And I'm looking at the time, make sure that I get you out of here by 2, by 2 p.m. <laughs> the message is about how to cooperate with God so that he can do that transformational work in us that's got to be done so that we will shine brightly. Because shining brightly for the Lord is not, it's not an automatic in the sense that all I have to do is raise my hand and say, Jesus, be my Lord. There's more to it in the sense that my, my job now becomes to cooperate with him. I surrender my will to him, and he said, Jesus taught, you need to do that daily. You need to deny that thing inside of you that wants to be like God on top, in charge, out front, in control. That's called the self. You need to deny the self, take up your cross, and follow. And I'm going to show you how to easily do it. It's very, very easy. Just don't try it without the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing, right? You heard him. He said that, John 15, 5, without me, you can do nothing. And then just a few weeks after that, he dies, goes into the grave, is resurrected, hangs out with the boys for another uh, 20, 30, 40 days, whatever it was, and then he blasts off the earth. And everybody's looking around at each other going, I thought he said that we couldn't do anything without him. What are we going to do now? And someone remembered, oh, yeah, we're supposed to wait. We're supposed to pray until power comes upon us. And then the Holy Spirit hit them. Amen? Well, I want to show you something from the Word to encourage you. The first time Jesus, uh, the first time the word sozo is mentioned, S-O-Z-O, I'm going to talk a little bit about that because my ministry is uh, sozo ministry. But the first time that word is mentioned, if you'll put that slide up, Matthew 120. Uh, actually, it's Matthew 121. And Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant, and they have not been together as husband and wife. They were betrothed, and in that day, that was considered a, a marriage at that time. You couldn't end it without uh, uh, giving a, vil, a bill of divorcement uh, to the lady. A woman could not divorce the man in the Jewish community, but Joseph had decided he's going to put Mary away because she's pregnant, and he knows he's not the father. So at night, in a dream, the angel comes to him and says, Joseph, son of David, you should not be afraid to receive Mary as your wife. For that having been conceived as her in her is of the Holy Spirit. In verse 21 it says, she will, shine for, she will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Yeshua, or Jesus, and he will sozo, save, heal, deliver, and make whole his people from their sins. And sozo is a full meal deal. We, we talk, I know, in the church about being saved. Did you get saved? But did, did you get healed? Did you get delivered? Were you made whole? 
And we're in the process of receiving the fullness of sozo. The moment you declare Jesus Christ to be Lord, you're absolutely justified before God. Absolutely, there is nothing more to be done. No further work for you to do. He's taken care of all. He said, it is finished. But from that point onward, we have this beautiful, wonderful opportunity to seek him daily, to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. And that's the whole problem with Christianity. It's so daily. Right? Yeah. That was a place you could have laughed, but since you didn't, let's keep moving. <laughs> now, Pastor Kurt also delivered a message about the five wise and the five foolish virgins, and I don't have time to get into that one, but I want to be with the wise ones. And I know that you all do too, and that means we want to keep the oil fresh and full so that we burn lightly as, as God's lights in Greeley. Amen? So this message is about how to keep that oil fresh. In, um, uh, as, we, as we seek to engage with God, I am reminded of the scripture in uh, Romans that says, that don't be conformed to this world, to think like and see things and perceive the way and decide the way this world does, but be being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that verb, be being transformed, is a passive verb. Don't go, don't give me blank stares. I know that that's what you did to your English teachers when they talked about passive verbs. But a passive verb means I, the subject, cannot make it happen. I receive the action from another. And in this case, the, the other that I'm receiving the action from is in this book, and he's with me. He's in my heart, the Holy Spirit. So if I don't engage with him uh, while I'm in the Word or while, while I'm uh, just going about my life, I may be missing transformational opportunities. Does that make sense? Okay, now two of you got it. Let's keep going. Um, how many of you, th this, is a, this is a tough question. Jesus told us to lay hands on the sick, they had recovered. He said, cast out demons. He said, raise the dead. And he said, cleanse lepers. Just four little things to do, right? That's all. Okay, how many of you have been doing laying hands on the sick? Anybody? And did you see them get well? Yay! Have any of you have have any of you raised the dead? I prayed for the dead. I've done that too, and I've heard of cases where the dead were raised, but I haven't done it. I have this personal. I haven't done it. How many of you have cast out a devil and it left? Woo! How about this one? How many of you have cleansed a leper? And stay with me on this one, because in Jesus' day, lepers were not just people who had leprosy. They were people who had any kind of skin condition that people would look at them and go, Ew, what is that? Unclean. And they would step back. So maybe psoriasis, whatever it was. How many of you have cleansed a leper? Anybody? Anybody? I think today we have lepers in our society, Harmony, that live on the streets. They're homeless. And they're the people that many back up from. Get away from me. But not my brother Elijah. You don't back up from those folks, do you? <laughs> Bless God. So I know someone in this crowd who is seeking to cleanse lepers. And that's, we want to all do that, but because we don't do it, that's why ministries like Sozo Freedom Steps, a ministry I lead, exists so that we can come into the presence of Jesus, let him work on our heart, and get our hearts fixed. In Luke 4.18, the next slide here, Jesus really shows us what he's all about when he launches his ministry. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon, is upon me because of... Uh, which, because of which he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. I probably ought to read it from up there. I think, um, I think Pastor Matt changed the wording. He has sent me to heal the broken in heart, to proclaim deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to send forth in deliverance the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, that's, that's our job description because that's Jesus' job description. But again, I can't do that without him, right? 
So you can see the word sozo, save, heal, deliver, and make whole in Luke 4.18. That's what he came to do. So here's my point. If you have said Jesus is my Lord at some time in your life, this sozo transformation process has already started. And if you want to see it accelerated, there are three simple things you need to do. Just three things, and this is what the, the whole point of my message is about. Before I get there, the Holy Spirit says, be sure to tell them this. The manifestation of the complete work of God in my life will come about, period. The manifestation of the complete work of God in your life will come about. It's guaranteed. He isn't going to put up with anyone showing up in heaven who hasn't gotten the full meal deal. So get ready. It's going to happen. You're going to get the whole thing. Jesus fashioned for each one of us personally and individually something called the seed of faith, the measure of faith just for you. Your measure of faith is not the one I got. And your measure of faith is not the one that Billy Graham got or Pastor Kurt, or anybody, or even though, even if you're married, your spouse may not have exactly the same seed of faith. That was, that was fashioned for you individually, and it's just enough. It's the measure that's just enough to do what he's called you to do. All right? And then he sent his Holy Spirit to activate this, this free gift he planted inside, this gift of faith, and he activates it by grace, which is heavenly influence on our heart. That's what grace is. Grace is being poured upon us right now. There is more influence on this planet today than there's ever been before, probably. Is that a true statement, Lord? He said, that's a true statement. Because where sin abounds, grace does that much more abound. And we know the world is abounding in that other stuff. Okay, so grace is being poured upon us to influence our hearts to know him and to do his will. But here's the kicker. So many people haven't got this. In the old King James, it says, faith worketh by love. Faith doesn't worketh by anything else. Faith doesn't worketh by confidence. Faith doesn't worketh by, by uh, studying the word and knowing a bunch of stuff and stuffing it in my head. Faith works by unconditional love, and there's only one place I get that, from relationship with my Father, just the same way Jesus got it. So here I am. I want to share with you how to get this and how to get going in the direction God may have you want to go. Before I, before I do that, I got one more slide here I want to take a look at. Pastor Matt Tarka, who is on the board with me, uh, spoke here earlier in the spring, and, and the, the message was the cornerstone of revival. You can go back and find that and, and look at it. He made a statement that just gripped me when he said it. A heart must have identity in order to develop capacity to fulfill its destiny. And this is, this is the whole purpose of transformation. When we come into the kingdom, we don't have the capacity to receive the fullness of his love and that fullness of grace to walk in it. We, we've got to cooperate with him and allow him to build capacity in us and to get us to a place where he can fully release us. And by the way, he doesn't have to have you in the kingdom for 40 years to put you to work. Well, we got four that time, Lord, who agreed with us. No, he can put you to work right away. You just got to take what you got and give it away. If he gave you forgiveness and you have the revelation of that forgiveness, give it away to people you need to forgive. Now, you don't need to go to them personally and say, Adam, when you treated me like a dog, you know, I forgive you, blah, blah, blah. You don't need to do that. Forgiveness, forgiveness is between you and dad. Okay? You don't have to go tell people you forgave them. It's between you and Father, because Father's heart has no unforgiveness in it. Now, Father, we lost a couple that time. Only one agreed. <laughs> Let me say it again. We learn in 1 Corinthians 13 that love keeps no record of wrongs. And the reason Father God has no record of wrongs 
from your past or your present or your future is because of the blood of Jesus. So he has no record. And oh, by the way, that also applies to all those guys out there who aren't here. All those people who need to know this. That's our job is to let them know, to shine brightly and let them know God loves them. God has made a way for them. Amen. So once again, let me, here's the warning. Do not attempt this without the Holy Spirit. Okay. Slide number one, three things on how to develop this transformational, interpersonal, two-way, conversational relationship with God. Number one, you got to talk to him. I knew that was going to go over. <laughs> Did you notice how many of you have been saved? Don't put up your hands. How many of you have been saved for any period of time, exposed to church, and you were probably thinking I was going to say you need to pray? Well, no, you just need to talk. You just need to open up and tell Father, tell Holy Spirit, tell Jesus, whoever you want to interact with. The Lord our God is one. We don't have three gods. The Lord our God is one. So if you like Jesus, talk to Jesus. If you like Father God, talk to him. If you like Holy Spirit, talk to him. If you just like God, talk to God. Okay? Because he's there to talk to you and communicate with you. And he wants to listen to you. I think Harmony said something like that this morning in one of the words. He, he, know, he sees you. He, he wants you to know he hears you. Now, I, this is really weird. God knows everything, right? And when I was a single dad, I had two little boys, and, uh, and I got through some, uh, a, a period of, um, of grief and recovery and everything, and I asked the Lord, I said, do you have a wife for me? And he said, yes, what are you looking for? <laughs> and I went, well, I was a new believer. I didn't think anything of it. I just grabbed a notebook, and I wrote out all the characteristics I was looking for. And they weren't all spiritual. <laughs> Amen. Amen, brother. <laughs> and I was done with my list, and I said, Father, this is what I'm looking for. Now, it never dawned on me. He knows all of this stuff. He could have just told me. But he wanted me to see what he had put in my heart as I was seeking him. That when we seek him, he gives you the desire of your heart. And he builds in your heart um, something that is going to lead you and guide you and, and help you follow the Holy Spirit. And long story short, after dating for, um, I cannot lie, we only dated for four months. Pastor John, please forgive me. Um, but we told him we had known each other for six months, and that was the requirement in the church. And... Uh, <laughs> But I went down my checklist, and I said, Lord, Debbie meets every, everything in the list. And he said, she's the best I have for you. And then he said to me this. He said, you're the best I have for her. And I pulled that Gideon thing, and I backed up and said, oh, Lord, you really want to punish her with me? <laughs> anyway, well, I'm getting on to my next point, which is this talk to him. If you talk to him, he's going to respond, but you've got to let him respond. So my next point is this, listen. You know, a lot of people talk to God. In the early days, I started out with the religious P word, prayer, and I'd go to him with my big list of petitions. God, you got to fix this. God, you got to change that. God, you got definitely deal with that one, Lord. You got to deal with that one. I just can't handle life with that one. And you know, on and on and on, there's your petitions. Eventually, you might learn how to bring supplication to the Lord. Supplication is when you're asking one more powerful than you to grant something you don't have the power to do. Okay, and we need to do that. We need to bring our petitions and our, and our supplications to him. But just start out by talking, and then be aware he wants to talk to you. Hosea 4.6 says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And the reason we perish is because if you look in, the, you look in this word here, so many times as the Jews were being delivered out of Egypt and as they were going through the desert, they didn't want to hear what God said. They told Moses, you go up on the mountain. You go hear what that fiery voice has to say. We don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear that. And so they developed that attitude of fear of God 
It was not the healthy fear of God, but it was a fear of hearing what he might have to say. When God speaks to you, he's not going to shame you. He's not going to condemn you. He's not going to put you down. And he is not going to say anything contrary to his word. Amen. So you need to, you need to understand he wants, to, he wants you to hear what he has to say to you. I often will go to him, Lord, why am I struggling with this problem? Why is this problem uh, mani- manifesting itself recently during COVID? It's been in my knees. And I've been uh, struggling with that one. And he said, because, son, you doubt my word. (laughs) Where'd that voice come from? I rebuke you, Satan, in the name. No. (laughs) Don't do that. (laughs) When you hear him talk to you, listen to what he says. Oh, so what what changes do you want me to make? And he said, I want you to go back to what I said to you last November. And he told me in November, I was in Redding, California, and I was getting prayer for pain in my knees. And um, and, uh, I I wrote down that I wanted the the pain to be gone in the prayer prayer request. And as I'm on, on my way to the prayer room, I hear the Holy Spirit say, cross that out. You're asking for the wrong thing. So I stepped out of the line, and I said, what do you want me to do? And he said... Ask that I will remove the source of the inflammation. Oh. So, so, well, okay, that's good. And I'm getting ready. I want to get into this prayer room. And I'm thinking, I mean, I've been around a while. You can tell by the graceful color of my hair. I have some wisdom. God, you have to give me a a team that uh, is prepared to pray for me. Amen? Amen. And this bouncy little, uh, practically teenager, comes up to me, takes my prayer, and says, you're going to be with our team. Oh, great. <laughs> so, so I head over here, and here's these, these raw newbies. They've been hardly with God for any period of time at all. But you know what they did when they grabbed my prayer thing? They said, Holy Spirit, show us how to pray. Oh, my gosh. That's maturity. Oh, my gosh. That's what I'm trying to show you here. And so they prayed for me. And, in fact, they broke. um, uh, One of them, uh, a young fellow, said, I I sense that there's some kind of a generational thing going on here. Have have you seen this in your family? I said, oh, yeah, dad and mom. And so they prayed over that because we don't have to receive generational junk from our parents. We can receive the blessings that come from our parents. And uh, so they prayed over that. And from November until March, when the shutdown started, I had no pain in my knees. None at all. Praise God. Good. Thank you, Jesus. Take, we give you all the glory for it. But then doubt entered my heart, and I started partnering with that. And I started the struggle. So recently I repented. I'm repenting before you and sharing this with you too. I've come back into agreement with God and his word that if since that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he is giving life to your mortal body. Okay? Amen. Take it. It's personal. You can have that and walk in it. And that's what I've been doing and been seeking him for. The number one key to hearing from God is to do this. Stop saying, is that God or is that me? Stop it. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and the voice of a stranger they won't follow. And I know I struggled with that for many years thinking, well, am I one of his sheep or am I still one of the goats? (laughs) Because I've seen a lot of goat behavior, a lot of goat thinking. But he said, if you believe in your heart and you say with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... You belong to him. That makes you a sheep. Amen? Glory to God. (laughs) Yeah. And it doesn't, yeah. Your behavior, by the way, doesn't make you a sheep. It's your believing that makes you a sheep. All right? So make up your mind. He is the kindest being in the universe. The kindest human being I ever knew in my life, if you spoke to her, she would speak back to you. She would speak kindly. And is my grandmother. 
And um, she would never speak harshly. She would never speak judgmentally, even if he was, she was correcting me for something. Well, God is greater than my grandmother, and he is just as sweet and kind as she was, in fact, even more so. Jesus said, if you being a child ask for bread, do you think your father's going to give you a stone? If you are asking for a fish, do you think your father's going to give you a snake? No, when you come to Father God to talk to him and ask him for something, expect that you're going to be blessed. Now, one of the things is the second thing to do in order to hear from God is to position yourself to hear. I, I can't, I don't have time to go into this and teach about this, but you have to be in a position to receive, a position to interact with him. And I have found that one of the best positions you can be in is this one. Watch me carefully. Get it so it's upright. It's, I'm telling you, this is one of the best positions you can be in to hear from God. When you start reading his word, and by the way, this thing is not a novel that you read from front to back. You can do it that way. But it's more like someone once said to me, a very wise person once said, it's more like an atlas. And if you want to find the way from Denver to Chicago, you don't start looking at maps of Europe. Well, I don't even know where the maps of Europe are in this thing. I, you know, so, so we should go back and study the maps, huh? No, no, no. What this is talking about is developing relationship with God. And you can see how some people have done it right, and you'll see how some people have done it wrong, and you'll see how God brought correction and how he always turns things around. And you may not understand everything he does, but remember, you're not doing this without the Holy Spirit. You're doing it with him. And then as you do this, as you read it, just this morning, I put these green stickers in the book of, of uh, 1 Corinthians those are places where the scripture stood up off the page at me one time when I was reading it. And it might have been during one of those times when I was in Wednesday night Bible study, which I will forever be thankful for that Pastor John did for the whole 1980s. For 10 years, we went to uh, Wednesday night Bible study. And often during that time or in my private time at home, the scripture would stand up off the page. And I started the habit of writing it down in a journal and then talking to the Lord about it. And especially if the Lord was giving me some instruction uh, as, as to what to do with that scripture. Because I don't want to forget, we all have the way of looking in the mirror, looking at our face and turning and walking away and forgetting what I looked like, right? Is my hair okay? I was just, no, no, I'm just kidding. We do. We look at ourselves, we walk away, we see somebody, and, I, and then I go home later and Debbie will say to me, who was in church? Oh, gosh, let's see. I saw a bunch of faces I haven't seen for a long time. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay, you're with me, good. Don't condemn me just because I'm preaching good here. I'm not preaching, I'm actually teaching, I think. When a text jumps off the page, I ask this, Father, what are you saying to me? And I wait. And I wait, and I'll write it down, because those are going to be rhema word moments. And the rhema word moments are the ones that produce faith. Rhema word is the sword of the Spirit. And I can ask, I ask him at the beginning of the pandemic, Father, is my destiny, is, is your plan out there for me to get COVID and get sick and maybe even die? And he said, no, that's not my plan. So now when I go out public, I'm bearing the sword of the Spirit. It's not my father's plan for me to get COVID, but don't touch me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, one of the reasons I don't shake hands is because my hands are so chapped and dry from uh, uh, using a hand sanitizer that I just, it's just easier to elbow bump. Because if, if I touch your elbow, I haven't figured out how to touch my face yet with my elbow. So I'm, I'm safe, you know. Yeah. So anyway. That's my sword, and my father gives me lots of swords. You can listen while you're driving in the car. Some people t used to tell me, but pastor, that's when I have my quiet time with the Lord. No, it's not. You're driving. You can't have a quiet time with the Lord. You'll drive off the road. You might hear him say something that you're not prepared to hear yet, so either 
turn off the radio and listen for his voice or whatever. Focus on him. My wife gets dishwashing revelations. I love that. You know, she's washing the dishes or something, then she'll sit down later and say, the Lord told her, uh, it was impressing with this. Listen to me, guys. Don't check out when I say this. You can listen to your feelings and ask God to tell you what it's about. God gave you those feelings. He didn't just give them to your wife. Her feelings are her feelings. It's not your job to manage her feelings. That's her job. It's your job to manage your feelings, and you're not supposed to suppress them and, and put them down and all that kind of stuff. Earlier in, I think it was in March or April, I woke up one morning, and I was feeling really sad and lonely. How many know what lonely feels like? I'm all alone. There's no one there for me. Those are lies, by the way. God is always with you. So you're never alone. And I know that. I know that in my heart. I know no matter where I am, I'm not alone. And so I just stopped and I said, Holy Spirit, I, I am feeling lonely and sad. Where's this coming from? What do you want me to do with it? And he gave me the responsibility to pray for someone. I believe in this group. He didn't show me a name. He didn't show me a face. But I prayed for someone who was feeling lonely and sad. And when I was done praying, it's gone. I managed those feelings the way he wanted me to. So guys, don't be afraid of those feelings. And if you are feeling fearful, which was huge, I remember in the, in the beginning of the shutdown, I would go to King Supers, and um, man, the fear was palpable. It still is in some places where it's just scary that people are so afraid. And I'd walk in there, I'm not afraid, I got my sword. COVID's not coming on me, amen? You know, don't get near me. No. <laughs> when I wear a mask for any period of time, I start coughing. And I found out in March that if the aisle is jammed with four or five people, all I, <coughs> <coughs> and they just scatter. <laughs> God forgive me. I'm walking by faith. I'm not walking by fear. Amen? But listen, if you do experience fear, that's what my ministry, one of the things my ministry is all about. We help people overcome that because we will facilitate an encounter with perfect love, and perfect love drives out fear. So don't, don't be ashamed if you've felt fearful or anxious or anything. Uh, get some help. Get some prayer for that and get it taken care of. Um, I don't have time to talk about all of this stuff here because I really need to wrap up here shortly. I don't know how much more time I've got. I've lost time. I've lost track. I've got one more point to make. If you're developing a relationship with anyone, you've got to take this third step. Because I can talk to you and talk to you and talk to you, walk away and never let you talk to me. There's not going to be any relationship there. I can talk to you and talk to you and learn how to let you talk to me, but I can walk away from that and do nothing with it. So this next step is to take action. When you have spent time with God in the morning or night or whenever it is, and you've talked to him and you've allowed him to talk to you, Look for action in his words. What is he asking you to do? Is it something he just simply wants you to humble yourself and trust him more? Then do that. But if he says, I want you out on the street tomorrow, there's a man out there who is going to need what you have to give him, and I want you out there. If you hear the Lord say that, do it. Amen? And he doesn't always give us things like that. Sometimes he just puts it in our heart to be out there and be light. Just be out there and, and be peaceful in the midst of chaos. Okay? So you got to take action. You got to you got to talk to him, you got to listen to him, you got a purpose in your heart that you're going to take action. Sometimes I get thoughts that are not uh, they're not real pure, they're not lovely, they're not wonderful not honorable. I know all those good thoughts are probably from God, but, and I'll write those down because a lot of times they'll minister to me and he's saying something to me that I need, but sometimes I'll get a thought that um, this used to, it hasn't happened for years, don't look at me like that, but it hasn't happened for years that when I'm doing my taxes, the thought will come to me, if I just fudge this number a little, then it's going to be beneficial. 
Now, that's called cheating on your taxes. That doesn't, that doesn't come to me anymore. I just hand it over to someone else and let them do it. <laughs> but here's how I deal with that. It says, take every thought captive, bring it to Jesus to make it obey him. So I would, I would focus on any negative thought, and I just simply say, Jesus, I'm having this thought to do thus and so, or not do this, or avoid that, or whatever. Jesus, what do, what do, you, want, what do you want me to do with this? How do we need to make this obey you? Now, sometimes he said this to me. One time he said, those thoughts are from your enemy, Bill. Tell him to take a hike and take his thoughts with him. <laughs> yeah. I, I, boy, I'm all about that. Lord, yeah, way, way to go. Boy, pick up the sword and you take a hike, Satan. And uh, those are not my thoughts. Those are not from the Lord. You get out of here. Love that. One time he said this to me. He said, those are not my thoughts. Leave those at the cross. Oh. There's something I've been carrying around I shouldn't be carrying around. It was borne by him on the cross, and he wants me to take it there and leave it at the cross. And then he said, I want to show you something. And that means he wants me to spend some intimate time with him. Okay? Now, sure, this has come to me also. Those thoughts are rising up from an area in your heart, Bill, that needs to be healed. And I'd like to do that now. Did you know... Jesus only healed people who were in agreement with him. He said to the man who was laying by the pool of Bethesda, do you want to be healed? I mean, come on, Jesus, the guy is laying there. He's a paraplegic. What's he supposed to be? Ah! Jesus wanted the man to exercise his will to receive from God. And that's all we have to do. That's what denying yourself, take a, taking up your cross. Your cross is death to your will. It's accepting his will for you. And so I pick that up and I say, yes, Jesus, I don't know what that area of my heart is, but I want you to heal it now. And then he shows me what I need to see, and I have some further repentance. And listen to me here. He never condemns you when he speaks to you. He never shames you, and he never embarrasses you, ever. Uh, I had someone come to me one time, and, and she was uh, a young believer in the Word, and, and she felt like God had told her to divorce her husband because Pastor John was going to divorce uh, Miss um, uh, Linda, and then Pastor John was going to marry her. And I went, wow, I don't think you're listening to the voice of God. Boy, that went over like a lead balloon. Anyway... Let's keep going. That same anointing that was on Jesus to do all that stuff in Luke 4.18 is coming upon us. We may not have the fullness of it yet. It's been coming for a long time. I believe we can walk in it more and more every day if we'll spend time listening to him and waiting on him. We are not God's enemy. You've got to get that in your heart, saints. You are sons and daughters who have been given the authority to become sons and daughters. And we need to live from the high ground. I was going to put up a video of, of uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi telling uh, Anakin Skywalker, Anakin, I have the high ground. You can't possibly win. You see, when you, when you do battle from the high ground, your enemy always falls. Always. But if you get down there with your enemy and try to battle with your enemy at that level, you're going to stumble. And, and if you try to battle with your enemy not using spiritual weapons, you're going to mess up. But if you recognize that you are seated in heavenly places, the, foot is un, the, the, the earth is under your father's foot, which means everything on the earth is under his foot. It's his footstool. And you war, you make war from that heavenly place. You're successful. You'll always be successful. So remember the whole purpose of transformation is to be conformed to the likeness and image of Jesus, that we would be perfect sons and daughters walking on this earth with God, with the Holy Spirit, following him and doing all the things that Jesus did and saying the things that Jesus said. Amen? So as we prepare to land this flight, I want you to fasten your seat belts and make sure that your seats are in their upright, most uncomfortable position. Be sure to stow your electronics at this time. We'll be on the ground shortly.
one page. God the Holy Spirit is here. Amen? He didn't leave because we stopped worship and started teaching. He didn't leave. He's still here. He can never leave you or forsake you. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? But if you don't know that you know that you know that, and you would like to have an extra dose of the Holy Spirit this morning, or you'd like to receive that immersing, that baptizing in the Spirit that Jesus has promised that he would do, I'd like you to stand up. Anybody? Be bold. Don't worry about what other people think. Amen, brother. Amen, amen. Anybody else? Uh, let me talk to this one. And, and there may not just be one in the room, but I know there's at least one. And this isn't cheating, by the way. It took me a long time to get to that point in my walk with Christ where I could say from down here, Abba, Daddy. That's by the spirit of adoption. Most of you, you walk in that as soon as you accept Jesus. You feel adopted. You feel like that whole orphan identity thing is removed, and you are a son. You are a daughter. If you don't have that, if you don't have that Abba Daddy, that ability to cry to Abba from down here, please stand up. Praise God. Praise God. I see that. Awesome. Remember, you have to position yourself to receive. That's all. It's an act of humility to stand up and say, Father, I want to receive this. And this last group I'm going to talk to, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a one and done. It's supposed to be ongoing. It says in Ephesians to be being filled. So I'm going to ask you all to stand up now, all of you. And we're just going to ask the Holy Spirit, we're going to ask Jesus to fill us up right now. And let's pray. You don't have to be touched by anyone to receive this. You need to be touched by God. And he's here. So, Lord, I thank you for showing me this a long time ago, that there are hearts in this room that are going to walk out of here with a greater dose of the Holy Spirit than they've ever had. And, Lord, without that, we perish. Without that, we can do nothing. Without you, Lord, we are as worms of the dust. But in you, we live and move and have our being. And it's in us that you live and move and have your being. And in you, we are more than conquerors. So, Lord, I ask you right now to touch those, those ones especially who stood up to receive that touch, to receive that, receive the spirit of adoption. Just put your hands in that position of receiving and just say, Lord, I receive your spirit. I receive the spirit of adoption. You don't have to have a physiological feeling, but some of you may. But expect him to hear your prayer, hear your words, and answer to you because he does. He never walks away from an opportunity like this. I thank you, Lord, for your peace. I thank you for your shalom. I thank you for filling us with your spirit of hope, the spirit of truth, the spirit of life in Christ. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for leading each one of us into higher levels of talking to you, listening to you, and acting in the way that you, uh, you choose for us. And I bless you all, City Lights, and I thank you for coming today. In Jesus' name, be blessed. You may be seated.